Look, look, a test a test matrix has two dimensions. Columns and rows. Yep. Columns you could think of as, and you could pick it either way. Let's say the columns are test cases. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um the rows are features tested by that test case or requirements tested by that test case or functionality tested by the that test case, aspects of non-functional non-functional requirements, you know, performance, whatever. There, there are different things that test case could test. And it's quite common for a, like a system test to test several different things, not just one thing, but several things. Mm -hmm. Like it may test several requirements or, or several features are included in the system test that logs into the system, plays the video, goes and deletes the video and and you know verifies that it doesn't exist now like th that might test several things and a test matrix indicates for a given test they call them what things is it testing and conversely for a given row say a bit of functionality it lets you read off what test cases test that feature or that requirement you know mm -hmm. which test case is tested that's what a test case matrix gives you it's that nice sort of ability to, to have traceability like what things what test the job it's the job of test case x to test which things or or which test cases are used to test a, a, a given feature if there's an empty row, that means that feature is not tested by any test case. That's good to know because it's untested. If there's an empty column, it means this test case really doesn't have a job in life because it's it's not testing any meaningful thing. Um, it, it is, you know, it's not testing non-functional requirements. It's not testing, you know, this feature, that feature, et cetera. Um, so test matrices let you see that two dimensions. Now, the other information that you were capturing in that, in your, you know, or your rendition of it <laughs> is really valuable. Don't get me wrong. Like okay. that's really valuable, but in my view, it belongs in a separate document. Okay. It belongs in a, it could be a, a spreadsheet of test cases where you have, you know, who ran it last, what date it ran last, uh, you know, what do you expect from it? Um, what are the steps or the sequence going through there? It might not like that might be a bit hard to put into a, a spreadsheet. It might require a like a Google Doc. Mm -hmm. Um, um uh, and you know, uh, did it succeed or not? Um, you know, what what's expected? Did it succeed? Um, those sort of information, I mean, those are great, but I would keep them separate from, you know, what does it like. Like what features does it test, et cetera? Um, so, um, you know, that would be one way to do it. The other way, if you wanted to keep it in one one matrix, you could. I mean, like what you said, but then you'd have probably different columns and be different right. different features. One for each feature. Say, does it test this feature? Does it test that feature? Does it test that feature? Because a test case can test multiple things. So um, uh, that would be okay too. Um, but, um, you know, I think there is a case to be made that maybe the steps that you're undertaking, which should be very concrete for the test case, maybe those should be, should live outside of a spreadsheet because they might be quite involved. I mean, there might be a set of 10 steps where you're entering different things, clicking on different things. Maybe you need images to, to illustrate it or something like that if it's a UI test. And, and, and that might be a bit much to put into the spreadsheet. So just some thoughts there. But the information that you specified is great to have. I'm enthusiastic about having it. It's just, it may be a bit much to put it all in one, um, one spreadsheet. And I would urge you to think about whether you might 
benefit by spreading by separating it into different documents. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's fair. Yeah. Um, Ali, do you want to ask about the regression testing? Uh, yeah, sure. So for regression testing, we're thinking of um, there's a thing called robo test in Firebase, which um, yep. simulates user activities and goes through, it explores the whole app and the UI and see if anything's working. And our what we're trying to do was to like see if the previous features are still working through the robo tests. So is this a good idea for a regression test? It is. I mean, that's a form of regression test. Were these things who are working before still working? Absolutely. That's very good. It's not the only type of regression test. And, and I'd urge you to think about one other type too. The okay. other type is the other type is test cases, which were breaking before, but have now been fixed. There are you know issues that that were now fixed where testing, you know, things broke. Maybe it was a formal test case, or maybe it was just something discovered by a user um, that, you know, this thing doesn't work, right? Um, this thing gives a, throws a exception when the user does this. So in other words, it may, may, may not have been a formal test case, but it broke before and it's now been fixed. There was an issue that tracked it presumably, and now it's fixed. You want to, for regression tests, also be able to look for those re-emerging because they come back very easily in things like merge conflicts where someone you know, might take, um, might merge together two sets of code, including one that doesn't have the fix for this that was put into place. And suddenly it doesn't work again. Suddenly it's the same problem coming back from the dead zombie like and you want to be able to catch that as soon as possible so your regression test it's great it is excellent to test features that have been working to make sure they're still working great but you should also have a, for regression tests a, a suite of these tests which hopefully were put into place earlier you know did not pass earlier and then did pass um, you can add them there, make sure they still pass, that they haven't, you know, the defect that they confirmed was squashed didn't reappear. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah, uh, I get that. Yeah. Um, also, yeah. so um, so we have the crash reporting um, implementation done with, using Firebase Crashlytics. So yes, exactly. all those Crashlytics uh, reports are being added to this regression as well. So this robo test will also test uh, the the crashes that happen. Like it will simulate that activity which caused the crash, and does it again, and just to see if it still crashes or does it work properly. I mean, that is dynamite. If you can do that, that's that is fantastic. Uh, please highlight that in your deliverable if you succeed in, in doing that because that's A1 good. Okay. I would love that. That that indicates serious investment in leveraging the testability investments to 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 test these regression at a regression level. So fantastic. Great job if you can get that in place. I think it's a wonderful idea. I didn't know how easy it would be, but um, in other words I I thought I didn't know that that was so readily done, but that's amazing if you can do that. Yeah. Um, and would this regression testing, uh, uh, would it be a good idea to run this in, the, in a pull request pipeline as well? Um, I normally would view regression testing as a bit heavyweight for that. Um, I know in commercial projects uh, that really invest in testing, the, the regression test suite can be huge. Probably for your projects, it won't be that big. But it can still be pretty expensive if it involves UI tests, et cetera. So I think you want to be judicious. Like, if it's viable, I think that's awesome. Um, uh, you know, but I, I think it might be too expensive to do every time for a pull request. Uh, I, I mean, 
I would be enthusiastic if you can do it, but I recognize the reality that it may have such an expense. It's not viable. Not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if it weren't for the pull request, uh, when would you uh, recommend us do the regression testing? Because I know regression testing isn't done usually, like like on a on a frequent basis. So would it right. be after like like a quality assurance testing once the code freeze is done or? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You could do it there. I would, I would say that's a natural place to do it where you might run the full test suite and so on. Again, I mean, I, I don't want to force your project into the types of practices like the, the types of constraints that are in place for big, big commercial projects where you've got, you know, tens of thousands of regression tests. This, like, if you can run it in pull request, that's great. But if it's too expensive, yeah, I would do it um, in, the, uh, in the QA phase uh, following code freezes. Yeah. And, and look for those. Things and you know, I mean, if if you if the or in general, when the test make it a tester team, a test team activity rather than a always run it as part of the CI pipeline, I would say you can make it a designated tester activity. Now, there could be a pipeline support actions, GitHub actions set up for the test team to run the test suite, um, including the regression test, that would be good. But in other words, it doesn't have to happen for all CI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that for sounds all CI good. Actions. Yeah. And mm -hmm. James, do you want to go ahead and ask what the UI testing? Sure. So um, UI testing is basically testing the functionality of the interface, or does mm -hmm. it also involve the visual aspect? Um, it involves the visual aspect. UI testing. Uh, using tools like Playwright or Selenium will be, uh, when, when, you, when you say, sorry, sorry, I may be misunderstanding. I mean, it's going through the UI. Maybe that's obvious to you. Um, I mean, it's it's operating through the visual, like the UI, the mm -hmm. UI right? mm -hmm. the graphical user interface. If what you're asking is, does it, I think maybe what you're asking is, does it um, test the appearance of things? you know, the presentation, yeah, or is it testing kind of the logical functionality, right? Um, right. Um, th it's better if it tests the logical functionality of things in general, because the, the details of the presentation, what's where, exactly how wide this drop down is, you know, um, the, the, the size of this logo, the you know, the uh, vertical arrangement of these images on the page or whatever, like, like those are pretty superficial things in terms of the, like those don't affect app functionality, correctness mm -hmm. generally. Um, and moreover, they can be affected by the vagaries of things like what size screen is someone viewing, on, viewing mm -hmm. it on, right? Like, yeah. are they viewing it on a tablet or a smartphone? And if so, is it a big honking Android, you know, phone with a giant screen, or is it a, a smaller, smaller one? Like those are things that you don't want to break your test easily, right? And mm -hmm. so generally, the 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 UI tests they they try to, although in in older times, you know, they could they would try to match exactly what was expected in terms of pixel by pixel representation on the screen. That's a, that's like the, that's gonna just invite arbitrary, you know, breaking for little reason, right? Yeah. Every time something is adjusted, it breaks it. And you don't want that. Yeah, th that's gonna waste a lot of your time. So, mm -hmm. so generally you try to make it based on functionality. Okay. Now, you know, you could say that well, in some cases, you know, where like a screen layout is really, really important for your goal, where, you know, it's everything. Maybe you do want to test something with that, but uh, I'd say use it cautiously. And, 
you know, for some types of tests, like with snapshot testing with React Native or React, you know, you're comparing like HTML tags that are generated that you expect to be generated against what's actually generated. And, and that's a higher level than pixel by pixel, right? It's, it will accommodate differences for different screen sizes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that, that is still UI elements, but it's not pixel by pixel stuff. Right. Um, so generally speaking, I'd say it helps your team if it's more on the functionality testing side, not in the side of testing the vagaries of exactly what the layouts are. But but recognize there may be some time you want to use snapshot testing and compare, you know, HTML. And, and there may even be times where, like, you really want to get the layout right and you want to be absolutely sure that it shows properly. And, in which case you could say, well, for this time, we'll, we'll have that test. We'll just recognize, you know, it'll, it may break when we change the UI, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, 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 I'd say in general test functionality through the UI test. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. That's helpful. Yep. That yeah. is um, system testing. Um, yeah. We're having a bit of confusion as to like what it, means i guess so i don't okay. know like could you like help guide us as to like system sure. testing sure okay um good um uh so so the idea of system testing is to be able to put the system through its paces at something more than the level of just one little bit of the system or the integration of um, bits of the system. Um, uh, and, and, and what I mean by this is there's often function, like chunks of functionality often associated with user stories or user, uh, you know, user uh, interactions, um, use cases that kind of go together. Um, so maybe, I don't know, the user um, opens a document and sorts it um, and closes it, or, or the user, um, you know, uh, goes in and uh, they arrive, they see a video has been assigned to them and they play it and then it shows that the video's been watched or something like that. Um, or maybe the user logs in and then logs out. Um, uh, maybe uh, the user, the user um, goes to the timeline, um, use it, adds two items to it, um, sees the results and removes one of them or something like, like these are things that are like common vignettes of like a user using the system that they're not, they're not restricted to any one thing. It's not just save the document or open the document. It may include those as sub parts, but it's like some user task that's been accomplished. If you see what I mean, mm -hmm. it's like, they've accomplished something. And that's why I say it's often associated with a use case or a, a user story. They've, they've done some chunk of work, right? Um, and it might even be one or two, uh, you know, two or three of these chunks of work. Those are things that aren't specific to one class or one function, or it's, it's kind of a, a string of functionality. And those system tests can be undertaken in, in a number of ways. So when I say system tests, it's, I sometimes call it end-to-end -end test, although that can get confusing what I mean. But mm -hmm. the point is it's, it's a string of functionality. It's like you, you accomplish these tasks or this one task or whatever, you know, or one basic chunk of work. Um, however you construe it, you can realize that you can undertake that in several different ways. You could undertake it through through the UI manually, like I can, I can go click and do these things. 
that could be manually undertaken and, and I test the system that way. That'll be a manual system test mm -hmm. of this and you, that you tell the tester go through these steps. Fill in this here, drag down that drop down, check that, you know, or pull it down to this item, press submit, go and click that checkbox to enable that, check that checkbox to enable that, make sure that it's shown properly and, and then log out. And so you could have a, a manual test script that will be a system, a manually conducted UI based, you know, a, a manual system test conducted through the UI. Another thing you could do is you could write code. So, so if you think about that test, that manual test, right? Mm -hmm. the, the user is undertaking these actions manually. Like they're the one clicking and yep. pressing the button. But when they press that button or when they go and they view the timeline or whatever, like there's functions being called in the business logic that do the work. Like they're, like pressing the button will actually go off and probably tell some, call some function and make sure that the request is okay and, you know, process the data and maybe post it to the database or something or, or, you know, when the timeline appears, it will drag data from the database. So using calls to the, to the business logic, it will drag that in and instantiate some user objects or some model yeah. objects and undertake some action. So the point is like the UI tells the system to do work here for this, to work there for that. Like it's calling off to the business logic to do its work. And what I'm saying is you could write code well, like, you know, so, uh, so I should have explained <laughs> first there, like you could have, um, you could have that UI test occur in an automated way, right? Using tools that do automated UI testing like Selenium or like Playwright or, or certain through certain emulators on smartphones or whatever, you could have it not manually perform, it's not a human performing it, but this test script could undertake those actions. That's what those platforms do, right? In mm -hmm. Selenium, you can have it run a test script that will click this, drag down this, click that, press the button, whatever. It interacts through the UI, just like a user would, just kind of automates that action, right? That's, right. A, that's now a automatically conducted UI based system test. It's a system test conducted through the UI in an automated way, right? So I first said system test undertaken through the UI manually. This is a system test undertaken through the UI in an automated way by script, right? Same idea. It's going through these paces or one, you know, one to three tasks, a chunk of work. Another level down is the, the business logic that's called by those UI tasks, whether from automated or manually, like you just write code that will call those directly. You, you call off to the business logic to undertake the tasks that, that the UI was telling it to undertake in those previous two, the, the automated and the manual one. So there, you're writing code to perform the user, to perform the system test by calling the business logic to do this, do that, undertake this, you know, like perform the login. Okay, now I've logged in and now, you know, go and open this, you know, go and open the panel, and, you know, um, query off to find what, what videos are assigned to me, grab the first of them, tell it, play it like that it's directly calling the things that the ui would have called to do the work <laughs> anyway and so you could call that from code that you write as a tester like you could write a system test code it's a test script not through the ui but directly calling the business logic mm -hmm. do this do this do this do this it's the same code that's run through the <laughs> that the UI ends up calling on the business logic. It's just 
you're not going through the UI. You're just calling it directly as, as code. Right. And, and that works fine. And so that's a third type of, of system test. And that one will often break less because it will depend less on the UI, right? Like a Selenium <laughs> test will say like, oh, I can't find the button. What do I do? You, know, you told me to press a button. I can't find it, right? Even a, a manual user, you may have a test script, a test definition, the steps, and the user says, I don't know what to do. I, you know, it says to press, to use this combo button to, to enter this and it doesn't exist. I can't find it. What do I do? Like it's broken. So test scripts going through the UI break more easily. Whereas if you're calling directly to business logic, often that is conserved. Like that doesn't change as fast. And so those test scripts directly calling business logic functionality, like directly calling model objects or what have you, those, those will, or calling the business logic to undertake tests, those will often be less fragile. They'll be more robust, more resilient to change. And that's very desirable, okay? So I don't know if that's helpful, um, but those are three types of, user, of, of system tests. One, manually conducted through the UI, um, uh, it's, it's performing this system test. Um, another automated conducted through the UI system test, still operating through the UI, but it's with test scripts, you know, something like Selenium or Playwright or whatever. And then finally, a, a set of code that calls directly to the business logic functions to perform the test um, and doesn't operate through the UI. But it really, it's calling the things the UI would call when you press that button, it calls to do this or whatever. So it's, it's just doing it programmatically. And that's what I call a programmatic, programmatically conducted system test. And it's automated and automatically, automatic programmatically conducted system. <laughs> There's no non-automated one. It's all, if it's programmatic, it's automated. It's directly. Yeah. Done. It's just running. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yes. Okay. Hope that's helpful. Yeah. Yeah, it was. Okay. Uh, sorry, going back again on UI testing. So are the visuals of the UI manually tested then? Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, like, yes. I mean, like a manual. So if you can get the manual, the users to look at them, that's good. You know, like, yeah. Like, because, you want them to make sure they're sensible, but you don't want tests that will break, you know, capriciously, like break in a fickle fashion, like like break every day or whatever, like that, right? You want mm -hmm. to be practical, and and it's it's kind of hard to 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 tell a test, make sure the UI looks right, <laughs> right? Like um, yeah, without making it too brittle, um, and but that's something a user can often tell at a glance. And so that's a good use of user time is to kind of make sure it looks okay. Mm -hmm. Again, there, there are exceptions. Maybe there are times you want to make sure the test test that it looks just so, but, but, but often, you know, that's a thing best left for the user, but there are intermediate points where the, like the, the code tests. So, the, so automated tests test the, they they test that the HTML generated for the UI is as expected. That would be kind of an intermediate one. And that's called snapshot testing. Okay. Uh, in in some of React and React Native. So snapshot testing, um, at least the use I've seen of that. I've I've heard sometimes users refer to it like I, I have heard a student use it in a different sense. But my understanding of snapshot testing in React is that it. It basically, you could compare the HTML generated by the system against what you expect for the HTML. And if it's different, you say, ah, it's different. And, and that's kind of a UI test, but it's not testing pixels, right? It's not testing like, is there a, is there a square here? Um, <laughs> in general, I'd say like the UI, it's really good for, for user testing. Like, okay. Like, it looks nice. And frankly, users are needed like a manual test is needed to make sure like it's readable. It doesn't look hideously ugly, right? The colors don't weirdly 
class or aren't so similar. You can't read the font on top of the, you know, the orange font on top of the red background or something like that, right? And, or it's, it's not impossible for colorblind readers to use, or it's not weirdly wrapped around or something like that. Those are good user tests, right? Like mm -hmm. manually, yeah. Okay. Um, co coverage. These testing. are great questions. Okay. Great questions. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. Co coverage. You testing. folks are team. Are team what again? Yeah. Team one. Team one. Team one. Okay. Okay. Great. Great. Um, code coverage testing. Yeah. So, um, so you know, you want. Um, we'll be talking about coverage quite a bit in coming lectures. Um, but there are frameworks, many frameworks for performing code coverage estimates for your test suite. So the idea is, look, the test suite tests your code, but how much of the code does it test? Now, it turns out there's all sorts of ways to quantify that. How many, you know, how many branches, different branches does it go down? But one of the most popular ways, and one of the ways standardly tested is what fraction of the statements or you know, pieces of code does it reach? And the idea is, look, if it does reach it, it's not definitely working. It, it, maybe it just happened to work that time, but maybe it won't work another time. But if you, if you don't even reach it in a test case, if there's no test case that reaches this area of code, that's actually a real big blind spot, right? Like you don't know if it works or not, that area of the code. So these code coverage suites, these code coverage mechanisms, um, uh, or 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 tools will um, will test those sort of things, um, and uh, they come in a bunch of different forms for different frameworks. So, you know, one of them that's uh, that's quite possible for for React, I think, is Istanbul, for example, um, and uh, there's other ones for for frameworks that are like java based and uh, there's a, a really popular one whose name i'm i'm just struggling with um i keep on thinking web sphere but that's totally different <laughs> um uh there's there's a um there's a very popular quite sophisticated visual one that is um that is used for it's called sonar cloud that's it yeah sonar cloud um Sonar Cloud is is very um, very uh, you know visual depiction of coverage testing. An older Java one is called Cobertura. Um, uh, there's Python one called Coverage uh, Pi. Um, Blanket.js is another one for for JavaScript. Uh, I think Istanbul works with Jest, if I'm not mistaken. But um, th these are Coach coverage mechanisms in Sonar Cloud allows you to specify, you know, like, yeah, what for? I think it's for different languages. What fraction of your system is is covered by, by by tests, and and that gives you confidence, or at least it helps rule out that you have big big gaps in place. Now, frankly, it's hard to get, you know, above ninety percent, and probably even above much above eighty percent for code coverage, it's, it's hard. You have to really plan around it. Um, but uh, it can be great for making sure you're not leaving money on the table by, by not reaching certain areas of your code base. So I would, I would go find a code coverage framework that works really well with you. And there may be some specifically for Firebase apps or for, you know, for the technologies that you folks are using. Okay, awesome. Um, that's it for me. I don't know, Adi, do you have any other questions? Uh, no, yeah, that's it. Okay. Good. Um, but yeah, no, that, I think that really covers everything that we've asked. So thank you so yes. much. Sure. You're, you're asking some, some great questions. Um, uh, I get every year people coming to me with testing, but this is one of the best um, sets of questions I've, I've gotten. So good job. And I hope that's helpful. And yeah, look forward to always glad to talk about testing. Take care. Mm -hmm.